Bergson and the holographic theory. Continuing, today we'll talk about real neurons, which is to say why the concrete biochemistry of the neuron is all important. Concrete biochemistry, not artificial, that is AI neurons. So let's go. I viewed this discussion not too long ago, this panel, Neuroscience to AI and back again, CBMM10 panel. I think that has to do with MIT. Not sure what CBMM10 means anymore. November 2023, so not long ago. The subject was on the contribution of AI, neural network models, to the, ninth, to the neuroscientific understanding of the brain. In other words, if we stay within the current paradigm, since neuroscience assumes the brain is a neural network, are AI neural networks serving as nice models to aid our grasp on how the brain's neural network works? Good models to bounce off of, in other words. Now, there's a curious point of time in the discussion, and this is what we're going to briefly look at. Before we come to the curious point, we need one piece of prior discussion. It's the turn of Christoph Koch in this panel, at roughly 2020, to um, make his comments. To quote, I'm here to make three points about biology and about humans. One, and the only point we're going to look at, is the existence of cell types, which ANNs and CNNs, different types of artificial neural networks, and modern transformers, the GPTs, do not at all respect. I think I'm quoting correctly as I heard it. So in other words, in these neural networks today, there's one cell type, if we can even call it a cell type. One, it's a, it's a homogeneous net of weights. I mean, I mean, even to call it a cell type is rather problematic. And he says, we now know we find something like this in the mouse. And next week, coming out in science, a special issue, the same thing in the human brain. So the picture there is a mass of cell types, the neural cell types. For spanning it just a little bit, there's a lot of different types. The current count is 5,200 cells organized in this taxonomy by taxonomy is pointing to that hierarchy structure. We've got, for example, GABAergic, glutamergic, and um, neuronal, non-neuronal, et cetera, et cetera. I, all the little uh, colored thingies there are the different cell receptor types that um, fall under the taxonomy. 5,200 of these organized in this taxonomy at different levels. Continuing. In one area, the motor area, M1, we find 100 different cell types. Picture there. And this is very similar in human and non-human primates. Say, this is a general. In M1, by my inhering of what he said, 39 excitatory cell types, 42 GABAergic cell types, 14 other. I know that doesn't add up to 100, but that's what I heard. But it's close enough. He notes that nowadays it is understood that in recording from cells, say in the retina, recording from retinal cells, it is critical to know what type of cell you are recording from. So very important. Now to our interesting point. So half hour later in the discussion at 57.30 for those who want to go back to this, the moderator, James DeCarlo, asked the panel to comment on what AI models, what the AI models are missing. So Koch answers first, to quote, I think he will, we will really be surprised by causal manipulations in the human brain. Things like psychedelics, which are a very powerful modulator of visual experiences. The Carlo kind of restates, and so you're kind of talking about interventions. Koch, how does your model respond to psilocybin, he says. In other words, he's trying to break through De Carlo's um, characterization. De Carlo, well, that would require a model with different inputs. Cock. 
this is where the cell types become critical because serotonin goes through specific cell types. Hmm. Now Nancy Kahnwisher, sitting next to him, a pure AI network modeler and enthusiastic thereof, says, so a more literal comparison of model units to brain units, that, that should take us further. And DiCarlo says, so, trying to summarize, a general optimism. We know we need to do stronger experiments and comparisons. In other words, so far, they still think that just, just means this, all these cell types things just mean a more complicated neural net. Same difference. Cock can't take it anymore. Well, we're also totally missing consciousness, he says. The room erupts with laughter. He says, well, why the laughter? Because we can see things. This cock unpacked. You guys should, should know by now what he's saying is, that your nets, the computations are not going to account for consciousness, that is for sentience, which is the equivalent of experience, which is equivalent to our image of the external world, our experience and our seeing of the coffee being stirred with the spoon, which if not sentience, I don't know what it is. To Carlo, well, maybe that's on the next slide. Well, hold, he says that consciousness question for later. So what was actually going on here? The cell types are an indication of this. We are not just dealing with abstract connection weights. That is, matrix manipulations we can easily affect in a computer, any kind of computer, maybe even a abacus for that matter, but with a very concrete dynamics. This concrete, as concrete as an AC motor all that physical dynamics. I'm not saying the brain is an AC motor. I have to say that because I've had reviewers that literally think I mean, oh, the brain's an AC motor. They can't get beyond that statement. It's amazing. Pardon my contempt. This is what Koch meant by causal manipulation. I'm making real causal manipulations on that concrete dynamics. In the motor's case, I might be changing out some of the metal parts for plastic or increasing the electrical input flow or changing the magnets, etc. Causal changes, causal dynamics, concrete causal dynamics. This was the message of this article. We published in 2022, Robbins and Logan. We are keen on the action of just one certain cell type, the 5H2A receptor. See it down there. We're, we're talking about a primary sequence analysis of the inductive index, an amino acid score that is central to this hypothesis. It's consistent with the importance of 5-hydroxytryptamine, I think I can always pronounce it, receptor 2A. Remember, so far, 5,200 cell types, just so far. Imagine the real concrete complexity in the brain. And we're looking here at just one psychedelic, LSD, how it acts on this particular cell type. We're not looking at psilocybin, DMT, mescaline, etc. These, I'm quite convinced, have quite different actions, biochemical actions, causal biochemical actions. And so we ask, why does this imply not abstract net computations, but a concrete dynamics? So in the article, we envision the brain as, in effect, a gelatinous mass. I say in effect because it was left implicit in the article, but for the sake of the visualization, visualize a gelatinous mass like jello, where the neurons are oscillators. That is where the action potential, the electrochemical flow going down the neuron is being one half the oscillation. The flow going from one end to another is just one half the oscillation, all under the control of a cardinal absorbent in Albert Ling's associative induction framework. So LSD has been observed to have a very high, that is the highest of the psychedelics, 
HOMO, H-O-M-O index, but it's highest occupied molecular orbital, the uh, propensity to donate electrons. Our own calculation, now I should say, really Dave Logan's was beyond me, show that what is considered the critical receptor in LSD, that is the 5-HT2AR, has a very high inductive index. So we're looking at that he's extrapolated the mean inductive index, and we see that that receptor there has a very strong index. The, the lower the number, the higher the, um, the power. The theory, LSD, via an inductive effect, is acting as a cardinal absorbent, like ATP, speeding up the oscillation rate of the entire mass. So this is a concrete electrobiochemical dynamics. It is well beyond the reach of just abstract computations. Of course, the argument here is that the speed up of the oscillations underlies the brain's specification of a new scale of time. A heron-like fly, as opposed to a buzzing fly of normal scale, flying by the coffee cup, and that this is veridical up to a certain dosage. It's an objective effect with uh, action consequences, up to a certain dosage. Too much dosage, too high a dosage, things get obviously pretty weird in LSD. And, and that this brings us closer to how the, brave can, the, the brain can be a wave, that is, a reconstructive wave in, in Berkson's framework. A wave, a reconstructive wave, like a, a reconstructive wave set passing through the hologram plate, uh, passing through an external holographic field, and specific to a source within the field at a scale of time. By this process, the source now being an image of the external world. It is the image, the experience, the sentience of the coffee being stirred with the heron-like fly going by the coffee cup. And of course, as I just said, the brain now act, being visualized as that gelatinous mass being equally a wave, a complex wave form. In other words, the answer to Cox, implicit worry. How are we going to explain seeing? How can we do that with just abstract computations? Well, we can't. We need a concrete dynamics. As concrete as a concrete reconstructive way of passing through a concrete holographic field. Of course, there are more correlated effects. The coffee swirling is going to be slowing down simultaneously with, with the uh, slowing down of the fly. The whirling flan, fan blade, should there be one nearby, would slow down. We're, we're talking, the conversation slows down. The word spread out, the word conversation, be conversation. And action is coordinate, it's veridical. We can reach out and grasp. Say if the fly were now stable, or even that heron-like fly, the, um, we could grasp it by the wingtip in rather leisurely motion because the action has to be coordinate with the, uh, with the perception. We're seeing perception is virtual action. But this is just one receptor, the 5-HT2A. It is just the beginning. There are all those cell types. Lord knows the true, dynamic, concrete, biochemical complexity that underlies our perception of that cup, our thought about it, our cognition about it, our memory. Slight postscript. In another session of CBMM10, there was the question was being asked: well, How much the, this diversity of cell types really matters? Because they know this was a discussion in earlier um, sessions via cock. This is Joff Hintons, who's a very big AI in it guru. This is a response. That's Hinton there. My guess is that the brain has been highly optimized over a long evolutionary period. So it's got all these different types of neurons because it helps to have all these different types of neurons, but it could do pretty well with half the types. Okay, nice guess. 
And my guess is sort of Crick's view that evolution is a tinkerer and it's been tinkering for a long time. And it's come up with all these little tricks necessitating different types of neurons. But you probably don't need all of those to get an intelligent system. So you got to believe a whole lot of evolution to buy on, on the nature of evolution and uh, uh, natural selection theory to believe this. But no, fundamentally, we're in denial. We can just treat these cell types aren't really needed. We can just go back to that nice homogeneous network. Forget the jello, forget the AC motor. Just need that nice homogeneous computational network where there really are no cell types. The brain, had it really been smart, had evolution been smarter, you know, it, it could have just done with that. So the concept of the brain as just doing abstract computations is going to die hard, very hard but it is going to die. So next we'll see. Till then, signing off.